First of all, I must apologise for my husky voice. Um, I have a touch of laryngitis, which is a lot better than it was two days ago. So hopefully I'll get through the two hours. Hopefully you can still understand me. I have lots of water to hand. Um, it's interesting when you have a, a throat problem, how many people come up with um, cures um, and treatments that you've never heard of. Um, so I'll be writing a, an academic paper on uh, complementary therapies for throat infections. Um, now, um, we have a two hour sl a slot this morning and we're going to split it into two uh, sections. Um, I'll do a, a general introduction about the Good Practice Awards and, and why this is an important issue. Then we have four case studies of organisations who were award winners um, in the Good Practice Awards. And then when they've presented and you've had a chance to ask them some questions, they're going to be replaced on the stage by some representatives from both Slovenia and the Czech Republic who are going to talk about the work that they've been doing as well. So there'll be a bit of stage management in the process. Um, and if we can get Slido to work, I think we'll find out in a minute whether or not it's working. We also have some questions for you. And my job really is to make sure that all of our um, uh, case study organisations um, present to you what they've been doing and you get the opportunity to ask them some questions about what they've, what they've learnt from the experience. Um, and we will be finishing at 11.30, which will be a test of my chairing skills. Um, what I'll do just to start with is a few introductory remarks and try to set this whole thing in context. And we heard a little bit about why this is important yesterday in the session in the afternoon. Um, so these are our list of speakers. Ooh, some housekeeping, all right, okay, fine, it's all right. Mm. Okay, it's all going pretty well. Yep. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, so, um, as well as being chair of the Good Practice Awards, I've also my real job um, is I'm a director at the Institute for Employment Studies in the UK. I'm also honorary professor at Lancaster University. Um, and I've done a lot of work over the last few years looking at um, ageing, health and work. Um, and particularly workplace interventions. I'm also a judge at the Global Healthy Workplace Awards, which is a global initiative to, to look at good workplace practices. So I am lucky enough to see lots of innovative practices across organisations um, globally, as well as um, in Europe. Um, as we know, older workers in the labour market is one of the big policy areas that most member states are increasingly interested in. Um, not just for economic reasons, but for social re reasons as well. Um, labour market participation of people over 55 is growing, um, and it's, uh, there's an increasing proportion of older workers in the workforce. Now, that is both an opportunity and a challenge, and it's something that both governments and employers are trying to manage more effectively. The employment rate amongst people between 55 and 64 in the EU, EU grew, by, grew by almost 15 percentage points between 2000 and 2014. Um, and the projections suggest that the employment rate for older people, particularly for women, will continue to rise across Europe during the next 50 years, reaching 67 percent by 2016. Um, now, obviously, we're interested at policy level to improve the sustainability of social welfare systems. Um, because our dependency ratios, the proportion of older workers being sustained by younger workers, um, is reaching crisis point. But also because remaining in good quality work can have positive therapeutic benefits for older workers. So we talked a lot yesterday about good employment practices and, and the quality of work. What's really clear from the research evidence is that work of good psychosocial quality um, and, and um, work that imp improves the physical well-being of employees can have positive benefits. So there are studies that show that people who in good quality work don't use health services as much. So there are system level benefits to this. 
Here's some data just from the UK. Um, in 2008, there were 700,000 people between so above 65 in employment, and by 2014, that had risen to 1.1 million. And to do this, we've, like many other countries, abolished the, the statutory retirement age, extended the age at which people get their state pension to 67, um, and we've had lots of campaigns targeting employers to try and improve their retention of older workers. One interesting thing that's happening in the UK is that um, 25% of people who retire go back to work within eight years. So we have this new phenomenon called unretirement. And it's very interesting that not all of that is just for financial reasons. So we have lots of quite interesting transitions around the age of retirement, some of which are health related, some of which are financially related. Others are because people find work fulfilling and interesting um, and they want more of it. And perhaps they retire prematurely in some cases. It is really clear, however, that health factors are becoming more important as the workforce ages. And this is something we need to take more notice of. Oh, interesting. Right. Um, so here's a chart looking at comorbidity. So one of the issues that I think we neglected to discuss yesterday was the number of people in the workforce who have more than one health condition. So we had quite a lot of examples of data yesterday for people with single conditions. But what's really clear from this chart is that as we age, we develop more than one long-term health condition. So in this example, again from the UK, 45% of people over 50 have at least one long-term health condition. Now, this is difficult to manage even in clinical settings. Managing it in workplace settings is even more complex. So thinking about workplace accommodations, return to work and vocational rehabilitation interventions for people with multiple conditions is something that employers will have to deal with more. We estimate in the UK by 2030, 40% of the UK workforce will have at least one long-term health condition, which is work limiting. So we need to improve the competence of organisations to manage people with multiple health problems. We also know from the data that uh, different conditions have different impacts on people's ability to continue working. So this chart shows the employment rates um, for people with different health conditions. So at the top, people with no health conditions, the employment rate in the UK at least is 82%. But as you get down to the bottom end, about 53% of people with musculoskeletal conditions uh, remain in work. For people with depression and anxiety, that's 42%. So this can have a cumulative impact. So you, if you have chronic low back pain and depression, then this has a combined impact on your ability to stay in work. So we need to think very carefully about how we do this. One of the things that's really clear is that the best predictor of early return to work after an episode of chronic low back pain is job satisfaction. So it's, we, need, we need to avoid over medicalizing these issues because from a workplace perspective, it is about how we manage people at work, the culture and the quality of the work we give them. So what do employers need to do better to make job retention and return to work easier for older workers with long-term health problems? Well, through the Good Practice Awards, we've been looking intensively at these issues. Clearly, employers are concerned to make sure they're retaining know-how, prevent skill shortages that threaten their efficiency and their productivity. And they also need to consider new approaches to job retention and adaptations that help accommodate the demands of an age-diverse workforce. And this has been a big focus for the Healthy Workplaces for All Ages campaign. The Good Practice Awards um, in 2016-17 have aimed to recognise companies and organisations who are actively managing safety and health at work in the context of an ageing workforce. We had a set of criteria against which we assessed all the different entries to the awards. They had to demonstrate a life course perspective to risk prevention, uh, to ensure healthy ageing at work, a holistic approach to OSH management, consideration for age diversity, diversity sensitive risk assessment, followed by workplace adaptation, and also measures for return to work. We had 42 entries from 23 countries, which is fantastic. We had five entries from official campaign partners of EU OSHA. 
and the judging panel, which I chaired, included representatives from EUOSHA itself, DG Employment and Social Affairs, uh, ETU, uh, TUI, uh, Confederation of German Employers, Associations and Maltese Occupational Health and Safety Authority. We met in January over two days to go through all the entries and to decide which of them had awards and were commended. We had eight that were awarded, eight that were commended. One of the official campaign partners was awarded and one was commended. Now, um, what I've tried to do here is summarise what I think some of the good things were that we found when we looked at across all the entries, and many of them were very innovative um, and exciting. The good ones we found had a very clear business rationale for action. So they were able to answer the question, to what business problem might a healthier workforce be a solution? So it's not just doing an intervention for its own sake, but having a clear business reason for doing so. The really good entries had good senior management support. So it wasn't just making an economic case, but also a moral argument for doing better in terms of OSH management for older workers. The good ones had uh, a clear approach to risk assessment and needs assessment that was conducted in a participative manner. So they included the workforce very much in the way they did things. They had interventions that focused on prevention. So they had a traditional OSH perspective, but also a strong appreciation of the need for positive psychosocial work environments. So it's not just about physical health. Um, interventions that focused on work ability. So thinking about how you redesign the work around the functional or cognitive capacity of the individual. Active worker voice was really important um, and high levels of involvement in design and implementation were a feature of the best entries. Uh, the good, um, good practice uh, involved clear evaluation of impact. This isn't just about how many people participate, but whether or not the interventions had an impact, impact on things like sickness, absence, return to work, job retention rates. Um, good practice involves capturing the learning from interventions. So you can see whether or not an intervention can be used in another context or for another group of workers or in another location. <clears throat> And we had multi-sector entrants, so from large and small employers, from multinational businesses, and also from those with very limited resources. And in some ways, some of the most positive examples we had were from organisations who were not very rich. Um, they didn't have massive resources, they didn't have massive um, um, dedicated occupational health support. They were doing this because it was the right thing to do and it benefited both their employees and their business. And we had some really good examples of those. I'm very quickly going to go through just some of the innovative elements from some of the examples. Um, so Heidelberger Druckmaschinen uh, from Germany. Um, I think there is very interesting work here looking at future demographics, so looking at the future workforce profile in terms of age. And they put a lot of work into co-producing with their employees um, adaptations and accommodations that were based on future business needs. So this wasn't driven by um, the HR function, it was driven by the business units themselves. In Zumtabel in Austria, um, there was a lot of work to focus on return to work processes, making sure that um, return to work was phased uh, and graduated and gave people um, opportunities to integrate gradually as they returned to work after a period of, of sickness absence. Federation of Finnish in, uh, for Technology in, Industries um, were doing a lot of work on evaluation and they also used the workability measure as a way of looking at what job demands need to be adapted to the capacity of the individuals. In Denmark, uh, the region Midtjylland, which was um, focusing on um, transferring and uh, transporting patients in the healthcare system, um, focused very much on risk prevention and had lots of interesting initiatives to um, make ergonomic and assistive technology adaptations uh, to help protect people from physical strain. Um, the Rudnik mine in Serbia um, was one of the organisations that perhaps had less resources than some of the other entries. They'd focus very much on um, mitigating the risk of difficult job demands and also focusing on uh, older and younger workers working together to transfer knowledge between older workers and younger workers. And that's uh, sometimes an unexploited benefit of some of these interventions. Uh, Lodus Krokelan in the um, Netherlands um, did some work to change shift patterns. Um, to allow older workers more recovery time between shifts 
and had an internal train, traineeship program as well, uh, so that people can acquire knowledge in different areas. Uh, Duzlo in uh, Slovakia had a daycare centre for elderly um, people to support workers with caring responsibilities and that's something that came up again from uh, talking to employees and having a, a bottom-up approach to managing the demands that um, employees have. Uh, Vasiliko in Cyprus similarly had uh, an approach to changing shift patterns for older workers to allow more recovery time and, and longer rest periods. And again, recognising that both the physical and cognitive demands of work can be difficult for some older workers and that needs to be accommodated in the way that they manage them. Now these are just very short snapshots of the type of innovative practices that we found and we're going to hear some more in a second from our colleagues on the stage. Um, what I would say is, and this is perhaps being uh, critical, is that um, when we look across the awards um, and the entries, some of them didn't make it um, to the final stage because of a number of different issues that I think um, indicate how good practice can be improved across a number of organisations. So I think better risk assessment to begin with, so you have an evidence base to see what your problem is before you start targeting interventions is a good practice intervention that I think more organisations could adopt. Um, I think some organisations still have the trouble that they focus on what someone cannot do as a result of their ill health rather than what they can still do. So taking a capability based perspective rather than a deficit based perspective on this um, can be more positive. I think there are still lots of organisations who focus almost exclusively on physical health. And of course that's important, but psychosocial health is really important too. And actually they're linked together. Uh, physical and mental health are strongly linked. So if you're just engaging in health promotion activities that involve fruit bowls and pilates and pedometer challenges, that may be fine up to a point. But if people are going back to jobs they hate or they're being mismanaged or their workload is too high, no amount of fruit will help them. <coughs> so. Um, be, be careful not to focus on, the, on physical and nutrition evangelism. Not many organisations focus very much on early intervention and referral to occupational health professionals to prioritise uh, effective job retention. And I, I'd like to see more of that. Vocational rehabilitation is recognised in many organisations, but few include tailored approaches to redesigning work in a way that matches the job demands with the resources of the workers. And we heard a lot about that yesterday. I'd like to see more organisations do that. Some organisations are using interventions for which there is no evidence base whatsoever. Um, and that is a worry. Um, so please be careful to make sure that if you're having an intervention to promote health at work, that there's an evidence base underpinning it. There's lots of information out there in academic and other studies. Please just make sure you, you're looking at those. I found few interventions to improve line manager capability both in terms of return to work and vocational rehabilitation. Line managers are crucial to this process. It's not just HR and OSH professionals who need to get involved, but line managers make a difference on a day-to-day -day basis and we need to make sure that their capability to manage these, is these issues is at its maximum. There's very little on self-management by workers with health conditions. So in most of our healthcare systems, healthcare professionals are encouraging people with long-term health conditions to play a more active part in the management of their health, just improve, to improve their clinical outcomes. The principles of self-management should also apply in workplaces. And again, we heard a little bit about this yesterday. Um, but trying to improve the capacity of individuals to play an active part in the management of their condition at work can only improve outcomes. And most of the research on this shows that job retention and return to work outcomes are vastly improved if individual employees are equipped to do self-management. And then finally, one of the big gaps in this whole area is evaluation. Um, and if you're going to invest money and time and resources in these sorts of interventions, which we know you're going to have to do because of the demographics, then it's important that you understand which interventions work and so have the impact you want. But secondly, whether or not they, they are economically sensible, whether from a business point of view, there is some form of return on investment. So I'd like to see more investment in, in efforts both to get the intervention right, implement it effectively, and then assess whether or not it's actually making a difference. 
And if you have all those elements, then you'll like to have interventions that actually support your ability to provide um, fulfilling and healthy work for older workers in the future. So that's the end of me. Um, now, do we have Slido working? We do. Excellent. Um, can you all make sure you're logged on? Do you want to do this, this now? Should we try this? Let's see if it works. If not, then we can crack on. Okay. So, the first question. Okay, is the um, proportion of establishments reporting that lifting or moving people or heavy loads is a risk factor? Have you got that one? Do I need to do anything up here? Okay. Right, okay, so you're all logged on. So we're doing this because our first presentation is about musculoskeletal conditions. You can see the logic. And the question is, what is the proportion of establishments reporting that lifting or moving people or heavy loads is a risk factor present in their establishment? So this is data from the agency's ESNA uh, research. So this is based on... I'm, I'm sure you read it every day, and it's by my bed, certainly. So, what proportion are we doing? Has everyone voted? Uh, the, answer. the answer is 47. So, well done. Um, most of you got that, or well, majority of you got that. So just under half of, of establishments report that these physical risk factors exist in their workplaces. Um, and we know that from um, across the whole of the European Union, about 44 million workers uh, have some form of musculoskeletal conditions attributed to their work. And that's data from the uh, Eurofound um, European Working Conditions Survey. Um, so this is a big issue. Um, and it's something that has a big impact, not just on quality of life, quality of working life, but also productivity. And one of the big political and policy issues that we need to address is, um, is productivity. And that's something that um, we're going to hear a lot more about. Okay, so... Uh, can't find your presentation. Where's your presentation? <laughs> oh, there we go. There you go. So now we're going to hear from York, um, from Continental. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to tell something about our approach, uh, which is called Ergonomics at Continental. Oh, I hope it works. I hope everybody of you is knowing our company, our corporation, Continental. I have only one sentence to describe it, <laughs> and I like to be very fast. Um, we are around 230,000 employees around the world. And there are 50% working at shop floor. And we have two rubber and three automotive divisions. That means when you go into your car, we are around you, I would like to say. Yeah. Maybe tires, maybe steering, everything we do there. Uh, our sales, Continental AG 200, uh, 22, 200 would be nice, but 22 billion for the first uh, half year 2017. In Germany, 2020, that's a little bit our driver. We have 50% of our shop floor employees are approximately 50 plus years old. So we make some studies about that. You know? Today, five years more, 10 years more. We focus on every time. What's our vision? Our vision is that we provide attractive and ergonomically designed workplaces. Uh, because we know ergonomics is not only health, it's also quality improvements, yeah, efficiency, safety, it's everything. It's also motivation. And so it's a big driver for us. 
And a future workplace at Continental should be age independent and it should be gender independent. What does it mean? You see here one slide where you can see only the physical performance capability because we know the abilities are different. Some abilities increase and some decrease with age. This is only about physical performance and you can see it above the age uh, for male and female employees. And the only thing what we have to do is to be there in the green area with our physical loads. Then we are age stability, I would like, say, like to say. We are independent of age and gender without risk for, for health from the physical point of view. So what we are doing is we provide a worldwide sustainable basic knowledge for ergonomics with trainings. Last week I've been in Budapest. The week before I've been in Delhi. We have their uh, tire location close to Delhi in Modipuram in Merut. And we make a combination of training where we do the basic training in ergonomics. We provide a software, an ergonomic risk assessment software. I will tell you something more later on. And we start the kickoff of the top five projects for this location. Yeah. So <clears throat> at the moment, we install worldwide multidisciplinary plant ergonomics teams around 80 at the moment with colleagues from IE, safety and health, plant engineering, and also from HR. And they all will be trained in the future, and they are at the moment. And we install a worldwide common ergonomic risk assessment software tool. It's based on key indicator methods, lifting, holding, carrying, pulling, pushing, manual handling operations. You all know that, I think. And the result of such a workplace assessment looks like this. So we assess a lot of physical exposures, environmental conditions, work organization, and also occupational safety and health. These are the three key indicator methods which are behind yeah, as a base for calculation, but the program is much more in detail. So we get seven level workplace profile, three green, one yellow, and three um, red bars uh, or red areas. And red bars indicate the need for action. There's something wrong in that workplace. And we assess a whole workplace over a whole shift. Might be with 10, 15 different work tasks. And we have to assess more than 90% of a work task, a work day. And so we get this profile. And the sick bar represents generic persons. And the sin bar represents workers aged 55 <coughs> or higher. Because in some issues, we have a higher demand. You know, if you are older, you need for the same work. For example, a quality issue, quality check, you need a lax number of 1,000. And if you are 60 years old, you need might be 1,200, 1,300 lax to do the same work in the same quality. So that's the reason why we have two different focus on that, yeah. And if in one of these cases, sin bars, there we have a, a red bar, then it, it's not age stable. So because we count this, yeah. In Germany, we assessed around 4,000 workplaces, which are corresponding to 20,000 employees at shop floor at the moment. And one more, this ergonomic risk assessment frame is the language for our global experience exchange. It's very important for us as a company. So a colleague from Mexico can speak with a colleague in China about the same workplace they have, but different issues. And so we have the same language about that. How we do this? We focus also, like the OSHA, on the good practice examples. And we have, for example, here a poor example and a good example. I will show you if it works. I hope so. A short video about that. This is situation before. Manual lifting of load around 25 kilogram. And this is the example later on. It's very easy. It's only for understanding how we do this. So we make our assessment situation before, we describe it and see also the good example later on what happens. We tell something about the investments, how long does it take, yeah, who was included in this project, 
and so on. And everybody can ask this colleague who did this how it works. They can take a look inside this location or something else. So, and this is also in a, in a database in our intranet. And we have around 200 good practice examples from all over the world because we make also our conferences in ergonomics each year. So, <clears throat> this is about we provide a worldwide ergonomics network experience exchange. Looks like this. And this year in April in Berlin, we have had the first international one. And 60 nations were attending this meeting above 50 locations and 130 participants, as you can see. Uh, we had also a fair with more than 10 different suppliers of ergonomic tools. And we have had a good practice award. Here you can see our awards. And afterwards, we've done also an, an optional training later on, yeah, because the colleagues from India, Mexico, or somewhere else were attending in Berlin. And what a good chance. So, our risk assessment is also a base for target setting. As I mentioned, 4,000 workplaces were assessed in Germany. And there we have KPIs, key performance indicators. And here are the most important ones. What we have reached also from 2010 to 2016, and our target is 2017, and furthermore. The age stability rate is the percentage of workers who could be deployed at age-stable workplaces, where we have no red bars yeah, for older employees. And you can see from 25%, we achieved 45.6% at the end of 2016 right now. And our new target for Germany is 50% because our staff will be around 50 years or older, around 50% in 2020. This is given by the board, this target. And the physical overload decreases from 46% down to 23%. That's a good work. I think it um, depends on the high number of employees who care for that in our locations around the world. So, furthermore, um, we will also later on, we have, now we have the bar chart results, and uh, we will see also the, the employee's profile later on, and we will combine it. Yeah, to check on which workplace the employee could work in the future when he comes from, from some yeah, problems, from sickness or something else. And so we can check this. Yeah. It's optional for the employee, for sure. It's a base for inclusion later on. So further developments and applications are not excluded and would be appreciated. We will see what comes next. Yeah. This base for inclusion is also only one, one and a half year old, and HR work very good with that. And we are very thankful to be perceived and awarded as a good practice example by OSHA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have some questions? So. Not the case, no questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you have any data on um, how the, your interventions have affected productivity and also the duration of sickness absence? Yeah. Uh, what, uh, in, in terms of productivity, we have some because, as you have seen, we take sometimes videos before, situation yeah. before and afterwards. And what we perceive that we have sometimes also a 50% higher productivity due to this. Yeah, it's not only working for health, it's also productivity, yeah. efficiency, yeah. and also quality. Yeah, you can mention if you are tired after two hours working, how can yeah. you produce quality for 12 hours? Yeah. Sometimes we have 12 hour shifts okay. in, in some locations around the world. And also for eight hours, it's a problem. How to measure it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a big problem. And I'm very happy that no every manager asks about it. Yeah, and so as you can, can know how to divide the impacts of the different projects is not very easy. And I, I don't want to make uh, an information about how we can decrease the sickness rate with that. Yeah, that doesn't work really. I like to be honest. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, mm -mm. Um, there's a question here about how much time you need to analyze and find out the necessary modifications in a workplace. So just tell us a little yeah. bit about the, the yeah. time requirement for doing some of these assessments. Yeah, the good thing is um, with our workplace assessment that we have the status. And we can make also, we have a, a productive database and we have a simulation database. You know? The existing workplaces are in the productive database and we can copy it out of this to the simulation base and you make some adjustment, maybe with cardboard engineering. We ask the employees how it could work better. Yeah, workbench height, yeah. for example, not standing like yeah. that or, or working like that. Yeah, you know, you have different ways yes. to do your work. You can do it in the good way yeah. or you can do it in the, the, the bad <laughs> way. Yeah, and yeah. so question is what is better? Okay. And you see it also in this. Um, okay. I hope it works in a second. Not I ah, here. We can compare it, yeah, before and afterwards, and yeah. we can see this. And we can also make some. We assume sometimes that we say, okay, each bar which goes down one point, and we count sometimes the number of affected employee and the the, number, the amount of money we have to invest. So we get something like, okay, points reduction of the load affected number of employees and also the cost for uh, so we get something like a kpi for yeah. this investment great so an assessment if you are very experienced with that takes you have to ask your superiors the, the employees yeah. you have to take photos videos or something else you have yeah. to prepare a little bit maybe four hours okay in a sum yeah okay excellent okay Thank you, very much. That's Thank, really you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right, we're going to move on. Um, now, back to a quick Slido question. Are we able to do the next one? Um, so our next presentation is about sickness absence. Um, so the next question I'd like to ask, if we can, is about the proportion of establishments across the EU where sickness absences are routinely analysed with a view to improving working conditions. Can we do that one? So you need to tell me what proportion of establishments in the EU 28 where sickness absences are routinely analyzed with a view to improving working conditions. The options are 70%, 51% and 25%. 25%, you're being pessimistic. How are we doing? 41. Any more? Last 10 seconds, register your vote. Okay, well, so the actual answer is 51%. So perhaps a little bit higher than you'd, you'd imagined. Um, the interesting thing about this is the variability across the EU. So um, the range um, is quite significant. So without wishing to name and shame, it's 19% in Estonia, but goes up to 76% in Norway. So what we have is variability of practice in sickness absence monitoring. Um, and that I think is something that employers will need to get to grips with. Um, I did a study once where we worked out that there are 44 different ways of measuring sickness absence from work. So you have to also choose the right measure that's the most meaningful for you. So um, your uh, estimate of 25% is lower, um, but we could still do better, I think, with, uh, with 51%. Okay, so now on that theme of sickness absence monitoring, um, can I ask um, Sari Tjanin from uh, Lujatalo in Finland to come and present on mo monitoring sickness absence and measures for return to work. You're very welcome. Uh, 
ladies and gentlemen, it's very honored to be here this morning. Uh, so I come from Lujatalo, uh, which is one of the Finland's largest construction companies and uh, works throughout the Finland. Uh, we have about 750 workers. About half of them are blue color workers. And turnover is about uh, 370 million euros. Uh, we are family owned business. It's not very family, uh, usual in Finland in this uh, size of uh, companies. Uh, construction work is physically demanding and it, it increases the risk for prematurely losing the ability to work. Uh, it was uh, earlier very, very typical that uh, construction workers did not uh, work until old age pension. Uh, if I remember right, it was 53 years old when they, when they typically uh, get out of the work uh, for disability pension. There are lots of mus musculoskeletal problems with long sickness absences and those are very, very uh, expensive for company. Uh, for example, one, one person's uh, disability pension can cost to Lujatalo, for example, 350,000 euros. It's a very huge amount of money uh, for us. Uh, in Finland, large companies pay all the costs which are caused by disability pensions. And at the moment, the risk for us is over 3 million euros, about 24 workers. So there must be ways to uh, prevent those problems early enough and support workers to maintain their ability to work. Uh, it's, it's a typical, typical case of long sickness, sickness absence is a construction worker, a carpenter, who suffers from low back or shoulder pain. We have a number of preventive comprehensive ways now. For example, here are only a few, few of them. We have a lot more. Lujavire actions at the grassroots level at building sites find out easier and more ergonomic ways to do the loading work, fa work phases. And uh, now we have also Lujavira app, which is the mobile application. At the moment, it includes 140 tools and equi equipment to make construction work easily and more ergonomic way. And here you can see the front page of Lujavira app. There are uh, very, very many phases where, where we have those uh, tools. And there are hundreds of photos too. Yes, but uh, one of the most important thing is uh, those preventive uh, ways at Lujatalo is the very early intervention process under the supervision of well-being manager. And here is the process, how it works. Uh, a worker has uh, either recurrent or a long sickness absence. And after that, early intervention discussion at the working place is done with the worker and the superior. The well-being manager, me, sees if there is or becomes a problem with ability to work and I'm contacting the superiors and the workers to begin the supporting process, if it is needed. And it continues with appointments with occupational health physician, mapping out the situation. Uh, occupational health discussion is, is very often needed. And then we find out what is, good, what is possible to do, how we can help the situation. 
if it is possible to change workers' work tasks for tasks with less load. It's not usual, but it sometimes happens and is possible. Uh, then we can use partial sickness allowance paid by the Social Security Institution of Finland. And this can last two weeks to six months. And typically, the worker works 50% of his working time. But if this is not enough or it is not possible because of the sickness, uh, we can start vocational rehabilitation and it need is, uh, and then it is needed cooperation with the pension insurance company. This is the successful uh, system we have and I'm, I'm very glad. Uh, typically job codes is needed and uh, he seeks information and different alternatives for the future for the worker. Uh, work trials are very usual, two to three months, uh, to own work or somewhere else. The working time increases gradually, starting with 50% of normal working time. Uh, then there is also retraining uh, into the employer's uh, professional field or to a new profession. Very typical, our carpenters retrain to construction engineers and they can stay at Lujatalo. And what happens? Changes at work contents enable continuing career until old age pension. And we are very proud of this system. Then some of our results, the most significant. Uh, sickness absence rate has, has declined a lot. Uh, from 5.2 to 2.9 percentage and the reduction of sickness absence is, is estimated at 1.3 million euros at Lujatalo and it's a great amount of money. So occupational health discussions are needed and they can prevent future problems. They are essential. And then the next one, vocational rehabilitation prevents premature disability pensions. Uh, last year we had 19 old age pensions uh, and only three disability pensions. Uh, more and more workers are able to continue in working life until the old age pension. And this is the benefit for all of partners. Such as factors, we think, are health expertise is needed in construction of company. HR's active role in workability problems is needed. Comprehensive and active early intervention with sickness absences close cooperation with HR, superiors, workers, occupational health care and insurance companies. And this should be managed from company. The right attitude to us change in the whole company and this means cultural changing and working capacity management is, is the top of that. Here is the poster from our building sites, Lujavire app, <coughs> and it's quite new. And maybe you can find out what it means. <laughs> there is a carpenter cutting wool insulation 
for one method, and then he finds out from the Luyavere app that it can be done easier. And the last picture, he does so, and is very happy, and so are we. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a question? You can put your hand up or you can send it via the app. Um, can I ask you, um, you talked about cultural change. Can you explain a little bit more about what positive cultural changes these sorts of interventions have encouraged? Uh, there were, before, uh, very usual that uh, superiors said and, and workmates said to uh, sick people or musculoskeletal problem uh, worker that you can, you can go home and, and be there. Yep. Don't come back to work. Yep. Uh, and also the superior said that uh, they called me when I uh, emailed them this uh, early intervention uh, process uh, asking uh, they, they called me that I'm not a doctor, I don't want to do anything yep. with the health, yep. but it's, it's not so. Now, now, they are not, uh, now they are not calling me or, <laughs> or right. any, any of the workers says that nothing could be done. Right. There is a lot we can do. Absolutely, and I think your, your case study it illustrates that brilliantly. Uh, sometimes you find that people think you have to be 100% fit to come back to work. And what you've shown very clearly is that phased and graduated and partial return to work is possible yes. uh, if you manage it carefully and with some insight. So yes. that's a really fantastic example. Does anybody else want to ask a question? One here. My name is Andrea Ferenc, you represent the order in Europe. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about the cultural change that you Uh, nine percent of our workers are women. Uh, there are few women which which have gone the same same system and and they have come back to work working life. And do you have any special methods used for women, or are you doing anything for gender equality? Or this nine percent is not that such a big figure? You know? Uh, our workers are, are men, typically. I, I, don't, I can't say how it works with, 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 with some, some other area. Yes. I would be glad to hear yeah. about if anybody would have experience and good practice, you know, with gender equality and women at the workplace, I would welcome to uh, forward to other women in Europe and each platform in Europe your experiences. Thank you in advance. Yeah, that's a good point. Did, York, did you have any examples from yeah, your examples from we have, women? We have several examples which um, dealing with this problem. Yeah, because we have in our company we have uh, different um, reasons in, in rubber industry high loads and so sometimes we have less than 5% female employees at, at workstations. In the uh, automotive industry we have more than 50%. So we focus also on entire locations to make them, the, the work better um, to, to have there some, some females also as in the shop floor area. And we can see it also in our profile if it's work or not. So, but I think it's a long time to change, yeah. unfortunately. But we foster this with our approach here. I have another question. Okay, sorry, Can we, we've got another one here. Yes. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, um, we know from research that uh, the main reasons why people disengage from work and eventually be absent, health is not of the one of the main reasons. It's more related to the job content, the relationship with etc. So, and the paradox is that sometimes a slightly, slightly higher absenteeism rate 
is better than a lower one with more disengaged people. So do you have information, so your absenteeism rate goes down? Do you have at the same time have information that those people who are now not sick anymore but at work, that they are actually engaged? Uh, our goal has not been to lower the sickness absence rate. It's not our first goal. Uh, I think the long sickness absence uh, uh, have been the problem and, and that was our goal. There, there must be some. Uh, we, we can't um, lower the sickness absence, absence rate to uh, zero. It's, it's not possible and it's not very good. Uh, but but uh, uh, I, I myself started at Lujatalo seven years ago and we have done many years work to get uh, this result now at the moment. So obviously the big problem is what we call presenteeism, um, which reduces productivity because people are at work um, but they're not physically well or psychologically well or, or they're disengaged. So. In some, I've certainly seen some organisations where sickness absence levels have gone down, but presenteeism goes up, um, and that can be a challenge, obviously. I think that varies from area. Yes. Uh, in construction work, it's not possible to be just there. I think that's a fair point. One quick question for you that's come through the, via um, the, the app is how many people in your business are actually using your app uh, we don't know it exactly. Uh, at the at June, we we promote it, it so it's okay. quite new. Quite early days. Yes, but okay. there comes new ideas, so it it, it says we are right. having successful system. Okay. Right. Sorry. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs>
So thank you, the organization. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I'll start with uh, a little introduction of FITAS. Uh, I think it's necessary. Uh, we're not like, for example, Continental. I think everybody knows Continental, but uh, I'm pretty sure no one knows who FITAS is. So let's start with that. Um, as just said, um, VITAS is located in Belgium. Uh, it's close to the Netherlands and Germany. And uh, it's located in the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. We are specialized in elderly care. Uh, we have a site in uh, Peer, in Meerweg Ruitrode and in Hechtel Exel. It's located almost 10 kilometers from each other, so very local based. We also have uh, three central offices combined at one location in Peer. And Visa, VITAS has more than um, 300 residential places. Uh, we have also short stay and uh, daycare. So uh, we have developed a wide range of solutions for elderly people who need uh, assistance and or residential care. And uh, that's taken care by more than 300 employees. So some years ago, we uh, did an age scan and that age scan revealed that in three out of four work sites, more than 50% of our workforce was aged over 45. And it was increasing. On one location, even 85% was older than 45. So because of that age scan, we became aware that um, we need to take appropriate conclusions. And the conclusions were for us first that we need to make extra efforts on ergonomics and staying healthy at work and fit at work. Second, um, we want to keep employees motivated at work. And three, we want to give them the ability to improve work-life balance. After these conclusions, we needed, of course, action and we needed a plan. We chose to work out several types of action. And to develop these actions, we established project teams. Uh, the project teams or the working groups, they have designed the logo which matches the logo of our organization. It's simply because it increases the visibility, it increases the recognition when an action is developed from a particular group. These groups, they were mixed aged. Members had to show their involvement. And of course, they needed also um, to have willingness to listen to each other and they must have got a mandate from their colleagues. All of this was, of course, important for the success of these teams because that created the necessary support in our organization. So these teams, they worked out several proposals. For instance, um, organizing team activities, a new kind of holiday management, and they also wanted to introduce self-scheduling. So we also established a working group concerning self-scheduling. And several years ago, a working group of uh, 10 employees throughout our entire organization was formed to investigate these advantages, but also the disadvantages of self-scheduling. And the question was, could this improve the work-life balance of our employees. They got a mandate from VITAS to work everything out. And they came with uh, persuasive benefits. After comparing several options, 
and tryouts, their conclusion was that employees were more satisfied. They had more autonomy. Plus, the leader had to spend less time on scheduling. And the scheduling turned out to be more age-specific. So in general, according our experience from the past few years, we see several benefits according self-scheduling. Having the commitment of the management of the organization, we noticed that all of our organizations save time spent on scheduling. Our organizations eliminate time spent on communicating about employees' preferences, about their needs, or about unexpected absences. The employee engagement increases. They have a greater commitment to the schedule because they made it themselves. It feels like being owner of that schedule. Uh, also, the absence from work decreases and the employee productivity increases also. Although, there are also some risks. It's difficult, we noticed, it's difficult to include everybody because simply not everybody has a computer of, is computer minded. And we also noticed that some employees they do not have wishes. It's all the same for them. So, what do we think the future will bring us? At this moment, we only have a few teams that organize their self-scheduling online. We have other teams that are still planned together, but on paper. Next year, 2018, we will gradually introduce self-scheduling online to all the other teams. And also in 2018, we, um, after the ownership of self-scheduling, we will introduce another team, the ownership of uh, learning moments, because uh, our e-learning module will also go online next year. So, our conclusion is, when uh, we want something, we just have to begin with it. Uh, you think everybody knows the one-liner, just do it. So we use it. Um, second, we have to make sure we will have a motivated plan and a motivated team with a plan. And we keep in mind that success is uh, not a one-way street. And last thing, we accept that we make mistakes. It's a proof we tried. So we try again with the goal in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for uh, Chris? Um, I have one about your customers. Um, so, is there any evidence that um, the steps that you've taken improves either the quality or the continuity of the care that you're providing in your, in your elderly homes from a customer point of view? Well, when you have motivated employees, it reflects on the work they do, so our elderly people, they feel it. I don't know if they see it literally, but they right. feel it, I'm sure. And but is that's it? what they tell, yep. that when they see that employees are more satisfied, they come with a smile. Okay. So, so that will be a tangible business measure. Do you have any other business measures like, um, you, you know, how interrupted care is, you have less sickness absence, you say you had less unexpected sickness absence, but is the total amount of, of absence reduced? Um, the total absence is a little bit reduced, but not significant. But um, yes, uh, 
it's it's physical very hard work so yeah. Yeah. the absence is uh, more related to physical so problems physical strain. yeah understand it's a really good example of a very participative yeah. approach um, I think it's a good lesson for everybody I guess um, you know if we're all trying to improve the involvement of workers in yeah. these initiatives yeah. it's a really good example the participation is, anybody... is indeed one of yeah. our main issues absolutely it's a really good example anyone have any other questions for Chris or any via the app no are we talking about a predominantly female workforce yes more than so perhaps back to the question we had <laughs> i didn't want to speak before my, my turn but <clears throat> indeed um that's a problem we also face that uh, more than 19 percent of our employees are women so uh, and self-scheduling is one of the items that is uh, in the advantage of women because the work-life balance is better with that self-scheduling. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? All right. Well, thank you, Chris, very much. That's really helpful and great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, so to another Slido question, um, our next presentation is going to be about um, workplace health promotion. So we have a question again from the Ezena data. Um, what is the proportion of establishments across the EU 28 that have at least one measure of workplace health promotion? So what proportion of establishments have at least one measure of workforce health promotion? Forty-eight, seventy, or fifty-six. <laughs> I got completely the wrong figures on my sheet. <laughs> they don't match at all. No. <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> That's all right. They're close. But uh, we choose the one which is the closest, yeah. which is... Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, so they've got it completely wrong. So the answer is 56. Interestingly, as far as I can tell. Um, now, I think there are, again, some big questions about what a workplace health promotion initiative is. So it could be that you have a telephone counselling helpline or that you put fruit bowls out, um, or that you encourage people to eat lettuce in the canteen, or you give people yoga classes. Um, it's a very wide range of activities. And I guess the thing that I'm interested in when I'm looking at good practice is how well, well coordinated those activities are. Um, and I think in our next example, um, we have a good example of an organisation who's thought quite a bit about how these things hang together. So I'd like to introduce uh, Simone Langewalters from SAP in the Netherlands to talk about workplace health promotion. You're very welcome. Thank you, Ursha, for having me, and I'm very proud to presenting um, the program of SAP, the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Simona Langewouters. I work for SAP, and SAP is a global company, uh, a leader in enterprise application software at the center of today's business and technology revolution. Um, I'm also a member of uh, the global health management team as a global health ambassador. Okay. okay, as you can see me in the middle. <laughs> um, 
And this is a network to foster, inspire and drive a healthy culture in uh, all SAP locations and uh, to foster a healthier lifestyle and therefore healthier and happier employees all over the world. And at SAP The Netherlands, I work as a, a prevention coach, an uh, ergonomics coach, and I face um, the consequences of inactivity on a daily basis. So, it was in the beginning of 2015 that I uh, read some uh, scientific reports. And one of them um, was from TNO, and that's a Dutch organization for applied science research. And they launched a report that it has been quite known for quite some time now that physical inactivity leads to severe health risks. But something that was virtually unknown is that prolonged sitting or sedentary behavior uh, also involves health risks regardless uh, whether someone meets the physical activity guidelines. So in particular, our working lives force us to sit for long periods. And so this can be seen as a new occupational risk. There are strong indications at the moment that uh, sedentary behavior leads to uh, type 2 diabetes, to um, cardiovascular diseases, some um, forms of cancer, depression, um, musculoskeletal disorders. So, conclusion. Um, especially in the offices, we sit too much. So, I have a, a question for you in the audience. Do you know which country we sit the most, the country in Europe? Anyone? Okay. I'm not proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's we, the Dutch. And um, that's because we have an, a knowledge economy and less industry and a high educational level. So another question for you. Uh, how many hours do you think that we sit in our offices on an average day? Do you have a clue? Excuse me? No, it's going up. It's even worse. So it's between 10 and 14 hours. And I mean in an office environment, of course. So you can see the slide. It's not, it's not a rocket science. And it's an average day. But there's also some good news to tell. By doing scientific research, we know now that physical activity is more a matter of sitting less or sitting less um, than doing more sports. So small changes can make big differences. So I would like to ask you, if you like, please stand up from your chair. Because we are sitting too long now. Just do some movement, yep. <coughs> some stretching. Exactly. Move your feet, bend your knees. You know, that's, that's all it takes. And after this, you can sit down and do it again in 30 <coughs> minutes. And what's happening now is your brain is being more active. You're, uh, you're using your... Uh, uh, big uh, body muscles, more oxygen to your lungs. You're being more creative, more fit. So thank you. Sit down, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There's still no international guideline for sedentary behavior at the moment, but we know this now. Um, it's better to interrupt sitting every 30 minutes uh, during the day than sitting the whole day and taking a sports class at the end of the day. Of course, you uh, must continue in sport. But um, one step, you know, uh, each step is one step in the good direction. So taking part of the program does not only provide benefits for employees with uh, less physical activity, inactivity, sorry, but also for the sporty ones. So our solution, Run Your Health for All Ages. It's a holistic program that mitigates the long-term effects of sedentary desk-based work. And our objectives were uh, to create awareness about this topic, leadership commitment, sustainable health, work lifestyle, mindset and behavioral changes, and SAP, a healthy workplace for all ages. So I would like to show you um, some leadership commitment and a, a small video from our managing director, Patrick van Deven. I hope you can help me. Thank you.
Beste collega's, iedere half uur bewegen helpt ons fitter te blijven. Jullie herkennen dat vast en zeker. Komt ochtends aan en je pakt de lift in plaats van de trap. Maar in 2015 zijn we met de Run Your Health begonnen voor een gezondere lifestyle. En dan loop ik door de trap. Volgens de universiteit en het TNO, wie veel zit, loopt twee keer zoveel risico voor diabetes en hart- en vaatziekten. Dus zelfs voor mensen die naast hun zittende beroep veel sporten doen, is het ook het geval. Maar dat wil ik u besparen. Gelukkig doen al meer dan de helft van jullie mee aan het programma Run Your Health. Jullie bewust maken van het belang van minder zitten en meer bewegen. Om meer inzicht te geven op uw beweeggedrag hebben wij de Fit SAP ontwikkeld. Fit SAP is een innovatieve IoT-oplossing voor fit en gezonde medewerkers. Ontwikkeld op onze HANA Cloud Platform. De kleine veranderingen hebben de meeste effect op uw welzijn. Gezonde medewerkers zijn. Gelukkiger en meer betrokken. Mailtje aan FitSAP. So many thanks to our managing director Patrick that he would uh, would do this for us. So how did we get our employees at SAP moving? So we introduced our uh, program, Run Your Health for All Ages, in 2015. And it's a program that can foster healthy habits and build the foundation for a longer, healthier and happier life. And how did we do this? By wearing a wearable. I'm wearing it now at the moment. It's a biofeedback tracker with Bluetooth connection and an activity reminder and web-based program for one year. And it gives you feedback about your daily steps, movement, sleeping behavior, burning calories, and your sedentary behavior. And it also has an activity reminder that's helping you to reduce this behavior. It gives you feedback about your lifestyle, so it creates awareness. It's based on, based on the outcome. You can make changes whatever and whenever you like. And it's a program for everyone, regardless your age, gender, and lifestyle. So, we supported this, you can see it on the slide, with um, uh, dynamic uh, equipment, with kickoff sessions, awareness sessions, uh, some nudging, signing, fun, challenging, or gamification, as we name it. Uh, fit coins, for every thousand steps you make, you earn one fit coin. Um, and a dynamic working environment, like desk bikes, adjustable desks, sitting balls, name it, we have it. <laughs> It's an, a holistic approach, and we gave also workshops sh about um, dynamic workplaces. So what can we do to move in the office and, of course, at home? Eating habits, so know what you eat and what you move. Sleep and mental flexibility. And here are some examples of the signing and nudging we have in our building. So what were the results at the end? Over 50% participation from our employees and management. And the fun part was that the other 50% was thinking, hey, what's going on over there? And some of them took part as well later on. A 100% increase among participants in regular exercises, more than 56% of prolonged sitting, and more than 30% increase of physical activity. And of course, it's always an estimation because of privacy protection. We can only see average numbers. But we see a big change in behavior and we will prolong these habits by communication and organizing challenges, changing our environment and innovation. And we need to keep up the good work and talk to talk, of course. So it's often asked me, so what's the success? You know, it's I, I, told, I tell people, be patient, but persistent, you know, because it's all about changing behavior, and that takes time. 
The program is based on the Kaizen theory, and that's Japanese, and it means change for better. It's a small step work improvement approach based on continuous improvement in a nutshell, small steps make big differences. And this slice says it all. I'm very proud to tell you also that a local um, initiative can be the grassroots of something bigger. And we did a rollout in 2016 with the global program, uh, Run Your Way. And it supports and encourages employees across generation and physical condition all over the world to invest in their health and well-being by integrating physical activity in their daily life. And the beauty of this program is that you can use the, the, the wearable of your choice, you know, if it's a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or whatever, and it connects people all over the world. So I would like to end with a quote from our CEO, Bill McDermott. The vision of SAP is that help the world to run better, improve people's lives. Our enduring vision is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. Nothing further this more than our greatest asset, the people of SAP. When people can come to work in a place that supports a healthy and sustainable lifestyle, a place where they can be their authentic selves, there is no stopping SAP. Thank you so much for your attention. Questions, if anyone has any. So, the latest systematic review of the evidence for standing desks shows that they do help people to be more active at work, but people who use them sit down for longer in the evenings. So, how do you try to get people to take the good practices that they're developing in the workplace and apply them out of work. Yeah, I understand uh, your question. I have a funny story about that. You know, there's, there's a company in the Netherlands, they had beautiful state-of-the-art adjustable desks as well. And um, they saw that uh, each and every uh, employee sit the whole day long. So. In the evening, you know, the cleaning, uh, the cleaning uh, company put up all the, the adjustable desks until standing height. And in the morning, the employees came to their work and they said, oh my God, I need to sit down. <laughs> and they were sitting again. So I think um, it's very important to um, uh, tell at first the, the main reason why you have to uh, uh, to use adjustable desk and to be uh, to to, cre to adapt an adjustable lifestyle, mm. not only at work yep. but at home as well. Absolutely. And it's all about awareness. Yep. And it takes time. Yes. There's no quick solution. No, you're right. I know for sure. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so your intri intri intrinsic <coughs> motivation to do so. Mm. That's the only way. Okay. That will work. Anybody else have a question for Simone? Down here. No question, just I would like to congratulate to SAP. They have the most beautiful, fantastic office in Budapest for their employees. And we, the Association for Women's Care Development in Hungary, awarded SAP with the Best Workplace for Women Award. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> <coughs> I guess the other question is about, you know, you talked about um, the Netherlands being a knowledge economy, uh, your knowledge business, um, apart from improved engagement and so on, are there some harder measures of business performance improvement resulting from your initiatives? Well, yeah, we, by doing scientific research, we know now that when you are moving awfully, you, your brain is more active. Mm. So when your brain is more active, you know, you are being more uh, creative. So, um, well, yeah, I think that's, that's the, the, the main reason, you know. Um, uh, we are also doing standing up meetings. Yeah. And uh, they will, you know, you cut, cut the time by, that's I right. mean, like 34%. That's right. And yeah. TNO did, a, did some research that 
when we do only standing up meetings in the Netherlands, it will uh, save 10 million, uh, more than 10 million uh, uh, dollars, a yeah. year, you know, euros a year. So. Well, it, doesn't everyone want shorter meetings? Yeah. Excellent. Especially I do. Okay. <laughs> Thank there you. There was one question from okay. the audience. Um, okay. I'm oh, sorry. There's a question here. Have you developed health indicators to measure the results of your program? How do you develop health indicators? Health indicators. <coughs> Sorry. Well, we don't. You know, we see the change in, in our organization and in our uh, um, building. And I think that's the, that's the most important thing um, we want to yeah, what we want to reach, you know, to, to create the awareness and uh, in the beginning to help people uh, to foster a healthier lifestyle. So hopefully in the end, um, we, we, uh, we do have some figures, okay. but it's not the main reason. <laughs> no, point. it's all about ambition or uh, prevention in the beginning. Okay. Uh, one question about the data that you get from your employee. Does SAP get the health data of its employees, or is it an external enterprise that treats these data? Because uh, it's, a, it's a, a legal issue. Mm -hmm. In the so, beginning it is, yes. yes. It's to help you as an employee, as a person. But of course we, we do some measures. We have an, uh, oh, it's, uh, for me it's very difficult. <laughs> uh, it's a, a BHC, it's a Business Health Culture Index. <laughs> I don't know who <laughs> made up this name, but every two years with, uh, in our employee survey, we do uh, measure um, how, what our employees think about um, their own health and health within the company. Yes, but the data of these Fitbits, of the Apple Watches, it's SAP who gets we, we these own, data no, yeah, on it individual is at the level. Moment, yes, but it's, um, wow. you know, the program I did in the Netherlands was with, a, uh, with another party. And, um, it, you know, because of data protection, we only have uh, uh, average figures. So, but we see an improvement. That's what I told in, uh, in one of the slides. But I hopefully in one or two years, we can uh, measure the figures with our own software. But not yet. Okay. But it's also data protected, of course. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all four of our speakers for some really interesting case studies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce to the stage our next uh, three presenters who are going to be talking about um, experiences in the security forces. And we're going to hear about some interesting work going on both in the Czech Republic and um, in Slovenia. Um, and so I'm going to introduce um, Martin Dolezal, Jiri Matic and Vlaka Komel, um, who are from the Police Directorate in Slovenia and um, the Czech Republic. I think, Ma Martin, you're going to go first? Hi, nice to see you. You're going to go first, yeah? So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really appreciated that we can be here today with you and introduce you uh, servicing facility of Ministry of Interior and also our project Optima. I think we don't have a presentation there. It's possible to. The servicing facility uh, is a facility which is around uh, 10,000 uh, employees and is implemented in the section of uh, economy section of uh, the Ministry of Interior of Czech Republic and provides really wide range of uh, services. Uh, for example, 
uh, facility services, uh, security, gastronomy. It's a really wide range. And one of uh, quite a new service is uh, providing uh, consulting and methodologi method methodological uh, service or activities to increase the safety at work, uh, health and physical and mental shape of our employees. In fact, we started in 2014. We started in 2014, the end of the year, and we had almost no budget, but we had an idea. Or maybe in that moment, we had something less than idea. We had just a dream. We had a dream to improve uh, the conditions of our workers. And uh, we started with a couple of people who were really interested in that idea and who were able to push the things uh, forward. And I'm um, really appreciated that we found such people because it was a great job. And in fact, with no budget, they moved the things and realized concrete measures uh, which can be introduced to you here today. Uh, in fact, the success was also when the project was commanded by the EO OSHA. Uh, the Optima project, uh, it's a project which helps in this moment to uh, the police and uh, firefighters who are included in our resort. Uh, when I spoke about uh, the uh, service facility has 1,000 employees, it provides the services to 70,000 people in our resort, including uh, police and firefighters. Uh, when I spoke about the Optima project, I think that everything will say the next video. The Optima project focuses on health, physical and mental conditioning for the work of members of the public safety organizations of the Czech Republic. It strives to improve the individual preventative care for one's own health. Na bench na zvednu určitě víc než 100 kg, ale myslím si, že to pro moji práci není zase tak důležitý, mnohem důležitější, aby ten celkový trénink člověk prodal v té reálné situaci. The Optima training concept is based on real-world experience from police and fire rescue services and responds to real-life needs. Optima works for relaxation from stress of today's modern world. We use body movement, breathing, correct posture and even modern technologies to release muscle tension and manage stress. Due to today's lifestyle, the exercise for vitality has become a necessary component of a healthy and happy life. We offer effective and efficient practice for correct posture and correct movement habits for all-round fitness and health. We aim all the officers and workers of all ages working in the field or in the office. Kvalita života stojí na čtyřech základních pilířích. Pohyb, výživa, odpočinek a psychická rovnováha. Co z pohledu stravy vyhovuje jednomu, nemusí vyhovat druhému. Proto je důležité hledat, co sedí právě vám. Training is meant not only for elite forces, but for everyone who need to manage stress effectively in real life situations on duty. Použití služební zbraně při reálné situaci je vysoce plnou záležitostí, plnou stresu a je třeba, aby policisté uměli ovládat tento stres, proto se snažíme výtvěk uspůsobit maximální kvalitě. Our educational concept works the human being as a functional unit because our body and mind influence each other very strongly. Learn the optimal practice and exercises used by hundreds of professionals of public safety organizations. Train with Optima. The Optima project is created under the service facility for the Ministry of Interior of the Czech Republic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Doležal. I'm the head instructor of Optima. Uh, we do this uh, because the work of police officers and firefighters is very hard and it stresses the human being at a physical and mental level. Uh, Optima program is about education, motivation and training that helps uh, with a better indiv individual preventative care of one's own health. 
We focus on uh, real-life needs, actually. All of our instructors are the former members of special units of police or fire and rescue departments. And we try uh, to use our experience to make the program work better for the real-life needs on duty, on the street. We train and educate and motivate our people uh, to move better, to prevent uh, the spine problems, joint problems, uh, to exercise more effectively. Uh, we motivate them to relax and train them to manage stress. We prepare them to a better performance under pressure in the real life situations on duty. Uh, we educate them to a better nutrition and sleep and rest. Well, as for our, our results, uh, the numbers, it could be stated in the state, the results in many numbers, like uh, 2,000 people who went through our program and the biggest feedback from, uh, for us is uh, like their evaluation and actually the fact that they use the training and the feedback is very, very good. Well, as for our perspectives, I hand over the word to my colleague again. In fact, after two years uh, of the Optima program already, because in the beginning it was a pilot project, but right now it's a real program which is implemented in new department of uh, special services. Uh, we decided to resolve it uh, and train another 350 uh, instructors who will spread the Optima program to all our employees. So it means 70,000 people. Uh, we discuss it very, very well with other unions who, who are really uh, satisfied with this program and promote it as much as, as they can. So uh, I hope that this program has a really good future. And uh, also we decided uh, to build a new 